Welcome to Reading the Room, a literary podcast featuring author interviews and discussions with bookish content creators. I am your host, Jalen, also known as The Bar in the Bookcase on YouTube. Today, I cannot be more excited to say that I am joined by Justin Torres, author of We the Animals and his brand new novel, Blackouts, available today from FSG Books. In the lead up to this novel's publication, there has been some very exciting news in that Justin is a finalist for the National Book Award for Fiction this year for this novel. We the Animals is a contemporary queer classic, and Blackouts, the long-awaited follow-up, I can confidently say will be joining that canon. It is a book about a lost book and its devastating history, about the free-thinking woman who created it but received glancing credit, and about two men, one nearing death, who, in telling its story in their own, resists the erasures of memory and time, a genre-defying, haunting, intimate, triumphant creation that blends fact and fiction and draws on records, testimony, and images from a range of disciplines. Justin Torres's Blackout minds the stories that have been kept from us and brings them into the light. It is a reclamation, a celebration of defiance, and a transformative encounter. Justin was an absolute joy to speak with. I had my fingers crossed when I heard about this book coming out that I could maybe get him on the podcast, and I was so honored to get the chance to talk to him. And our conversation was actually recorded on the morning in which he learned that he was long-listed for the National Book Award, which is a really fun addition to our conversation. I really hope you enjoy this conversation with Justin. It's really important to me. And if you enjoy this episode or enjoy reading the room generally a great way to support the podcast is leaving a five-star review wherever you get those podcasts or otherwise sharing the episode with friends and family is another great way of supporting the show as well now without further ado let's get into the discussion with justin torres justin thank you so much for joining me today i'm really really happy to be here yeah it's been a kind of wild morning and yeah we have to talk about that first um blackouts was just long listed for the national book award for fiction this morning so First question for you, how are you feeling? How are you doing? And we're a couple weeks out from publication, so it's a little, it's a cool time to be talking to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it was great. It was great news. I'm delighted. Uh, I think that I haven't stopped talking. Like, you know, it, it, it just got announced a couple hours ago and, you know, it's, I'm on the, I'm on the West Coast. So it was like 7 a.m. And I've just been like talking to friends and my editor and, so yeah, like like I said, I'm a little bit frazzled, but um, I'm really yeah, I'm really happy in it. And yeah, I was nervous. I was nervous about this book because it's it's challenging. I think um, so I think it will help. It'll help a lot as we move towards pub date. Yeah, I mean it's a really ambitious work. I would say um, it's something it's unlike anything I've ever read. So I was really excited to talk to you about it to try to unpack what's going on. But I think. You know, even in the post phase of the book, you kind of talk about what you're doing here. So I'll save that for later. But I guess just to start with the title and blackouts, can you talk about how you landed on this title? And that might stem from where the book started for you, kind of open floor of what blackouts means for you. Yeah, I landed on the title after making the actual blackouts that appear in the book, right? So I was working at a bookstore in San Francisco many years ago, and somebody brought in a box of books. My hunch was that they were from somebody who had died um, because they were a lot of queer texts from a kind of certain era, a lot of fiction, things like Andre Gide, and, you know, and then there were this sex variance book, which is this medical study, which is kind of the central text of, of my book, Blackouts. And I knew I wanted to write about it. I didn't know how I wanted to write about it. I think my first impulse was to kind of make characters out of these participants in this 1930s medical study about homosexuality. But I was also really interested in, in the text itself, right? Like the competing voices. So there was these case studies where they, these people would come in and they would talk about their sex lives in great detail and their lives in general. And then there was this overlay of this very pathological medical language that was stigmatizing. And so I started to try and you know, take these these kind of different discourses and, and pull them apart from one another. And what I didn't, ended up doing was just to start blacking out some of, some of the text. And then it, and then I kind of moved into making erasure poems out of the text. And I simultaneously was writing these, another piece about a character who's suffering from these moments of blacking out of memory loss, of just losing time altogether. And then I think something occurred to me, I was like, oh, these these are very much related to each other. They're different forms of, of blacking out. They, they have a lot to do with one another. And, and, and so that's when I landed on the title. What you're speaking to, I think, is, you know, really indicative of how this book reads, too, because there's a lot of layering going on. The, the book is sort of structured, like the conceit of the novel is a dialogue between two characters and then interspersed 
in that dialogue is, you know, actual pictures and photos. So I, I'm wondering in terms of the conceit of the novel being this dialogue between these characters and how you kind of thought about making this exploration of history into narrative, like how did that process work for you? Yeah, yeah. So dialogue between Huan Gay and the young narrator, you know, one is old and, and dying and, and the narrator is kind of in his late 20s. I mean, there was a number of, of ways in which I arrived at that, but a, but a huge influence was Manuel Puig, Kiss of the Spider Woman. And the, one of the reasons that that was so hugely influential is because it was an influential text on me, but it was also one of those texts that kind of every older queer Latinx person that I have ever met has has talked about or referenced or you know I think it's just it's just like a really important book and 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 in that book there's there are two people you know in a jail cell together one of them's there for being queer and the other is there for being a kind of revolutionary and they're having this dialogue and what they do is they describe movie well, well one of them, Molina, describes the plots of, of movies and kind of makes them up as, as he goes along. I don't know. It's just there's something like really, I really wanted to like pay homage to that text. I really wanted to borrow from that text. I really wanted to engage with that text in a, in a major way. And so that, so that was kind of when I started to move into the dialogue, like with the really, really, really heavy dialogue direction. The other thing that I was really interested in was this kind of intergenerational dialogue. I'm of a generation where the generation immediately above me was just devastated by AIDS, right? And then there's a the generation kind of above that, which is Juan's generation. I don't know. I, I, I'm really interested in, in, you know, kind of like, I don't know, of, of kind of reaching back and trying to engage and think about queerness, you know, and, and, the different kinds of pressures that have been on queerness over time, right? One of the things that that's that's really lovely about the sex variant study is that there's so much is undefined at that at that time, right? Like they have these all these categories, there's all these taxonomies of of different kind, like they've got homosexuals and hoodlum homosexuals and narcissistic homosexuals, and you know, and they're 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 different categorizations are it's all in flux right none of this has really been fixed yet and I think that's such like that generation is so fascinating to me because there's something super queer about that and about that time you know yeah it was exciting to try and be in dialogue with the past right like what is dead and dying and kind of evaporating all the time yeah that's really interesting because I think something you're doing, it's really interesting in this book as well is, so I'm referencing the epigraph that introduces part two called The Variant, and it is more often the urge to document and the urge to disappear, though contradictory, are fused. And I was reflecting on that um, in this book in terms of how this book feels like, you know, at once a documentation, but there's, you know, overt attempts to obfuscate or like, to, to black out certain things, um, you know, key example being, for example, like the narrator's picture of his parents um, with him as a baby and the faces are scribbled out. So there's still this, you know, attempt to document and make a connection, yet it removes certain like identifying information, for example. So I guess my question for you is about this sort of balance you play with documentation and disappearance. And I think a lot of my questions on this podcast go to like auto fiction. Um, and I know, as I mentioned before, the post face kind of anticipates these things. So I don't mean to ask you, like what is real and what's not, but just how you think about that balance of documentation and disappearance in fiction. Yeah, so so that epigraph is from um, Heather Love and she, I don't read a ton of literary criticism, but she is somebody that I just really think is the cat's meow. Like um, her first book, Feeling Backward, is, is I don't know, I just, I just think it's phenomenal. And this is from her book, Underdogs. And yeah, the, the idea that that oftentimes this desire to kind of, I mean, especially when you're talking about underground cultures or hidden histories or whatever, right? Like there's, there is this urge to both capture and, and to disguise, right? And, and not to kind of make available what was happening in the dark, right? That, that is the push and pull of this book. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Which is like, may, like hope, hopefully the reader's thinking about all of, there's all these gaps and fissures and, erasures and there's also quite a lot of what feels like 
very personal disclosure, right? And the photograph that you referenced, absolutely, like that's, you know, even in the end notes, it doesn't say where that photograph comes from. It just says this is a personal photograph from a personal collection. I think that there's there's a lot of me in the book. Like I'm not, I'm completely unafraid to, to acknowledge that, you know, like anybody who read my first book, like they know that, you know, I write a lot from personal experience. It's fiction. It's always fiction. And this book is fiction as well. It's out there that I was institutionalized when I was a teenager. Like I've written about that before. Um, it's, you know, like I've, I've written about sex work before. I've written about like, you know, there's, there are there overlaps? Absolutely. Right. Like this, you could easily see this character being a continuation of the, the, main character from my first book, We the Animals. It's also very much not my life, you know? It's like, like you know, it's like just creating persona and writing from that persona. And, you know, I had a lot of fun emphasizing the textual and the literary, right? So like Juan is such a literary character. Like he's always referencing other texts and other literatures. The book is always referencing other texts and other literatures. And then there's actual photocopied pages from other texts um, in here that that have been tinkered with and altered with and and so yeah there's this revelation revelation there's disclosure but there's also this this way of saying like you can't you can't actually access beyond the text that's in front of you right like it's, it's um there's something that's being hidden and held back for sure one of my favorite ideas in this book it, it kind of stems from that too but it's on page 109 is about craftsmanship and like making meaning of the past. So I'm referring to like Browning and the trial documents and mm. the quote is like the pure hard metal of fact made malleable by the alloy of his imagination. I think that's a beautiful way of encapsulating that idea. I guess to ask you a question about that idea in this book, as I mentioned, you know, there's, there's a dialogue going on and the differences between the narrator and Juan and kind of their approaches to storytelling and the way that they converse with each other. It, it has this like dreamlike quality to it and it kind of feels like it's suspended in this other like world, for lack of a better word, I guess. And there's a lot of like humor at play in their discussion, which I really loved. And so I guess just tying those ideas together of making malleable facts and using imagination to kind of expound upon that. Like, how did you think about crafting that dialogue and that kind of play in their exchanges? Yeah, 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 yeah. The Browning, I was describing this project to my boyfriend and he was the one who was like, oh, you need to read this this Robert Browning book, The Ring in the Book. And it's it's all about making something out of documents that you find. And And what do you do, right? Like, like, how do you make the inertness malleable, right? Like, how do you make this, you just have this stuff, like you, you go into the archive and it's just, it's there and it's it seems fixed and unchangeable. And how do you, how do you do that, right? And this idea of you know, using your imagination to, as an alloy. It's a great book, The Ring in the Book. It's really fascinating. It's like early true crime, but also it was a good, it was an inspiration to me for sure. And this is like to the, to, to the question about humor. I think that, the young narrator comes in and he's quite earnest and also he's sad. He's like a sad boy. <laughs> he's, a, he's a bit lost in his own life. He's kind of like a hungry ghost, right? He's just, he's just kind of drifting. And I think that one of the most important things that Juan is constantly reminding him and teaching him is to laugh at himself, right? And to laugh at, you know, the, the cosmic joke of the universe. And I think that again is is one of the lessons. I think the, when when I look back right at, at queer history, right, it's like one of that is one of the most important things um, that it can teach is is a is a sense of humor and irony. Yeah, it was really important to have that in the book. It's not my natural impulse. Like as a, as a person, I'm funny. <laughs> as a, as like in life, like I'm just, you know, I have a very, very dark sense of humor. But for whatever reason on the page, I just I tend towards a certain kind of lyricism or earnestness or I don't know, sentimentality even. Like I'm not afraid of I'm not afraid of of being um painted as sentimental. But I wanted I wanted to kind of evolve. And so one of the things that that's happening in the text is like one is one is there right to, to change the actual 
tone of the writing um, to like to switch things up. Yeah. So there's a, a big section of the book in which they're kind of telling each other stories of their lives or other characters' lives in the form of like film, um, which I think is really interesting as mm-hmm. a way that you're kind of transposing that form into fiction. How did you think about film with this book and storytelling? Yeah, this this text comes from so many different sources. And so I talked about Puig and and Kiss of the Spider Woman. One of the reasons why that why I love that book is because it was something that my very first boyfriend and I used to do. We we were working on a farm and we had no electricity and we used to just like tell each other the plots of movies that the other one hadn't seen yet. Cause it was just like, what, what do you do with like the hours in the night, you know? And so, and so we would do that. And then I read this book where people were doing that. And I, I was like, this is like, you know, it's like one of those things where it's like, this is incredible. Cause I hadn't yet read cause it's a spider woman. This, we were so young at this point, I'm like 19, you know? And then I wrote a story about that. And the story is in, included in the novel. Right. And so some of some of some things that I've been writing and working on for a while are in the novel. And what Juan does is he interrupts the, the narrator, right? Like so the narrator will be like telling some he'll be making up some movie about his past life and his, you know, like lovers or whatever. And and Juan will interrupt and be like, oh, this is like 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 oh a flashback at the moment of climax, like really. <laughs> like, like that's that's what you're doing here and you know and 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 it interjects that humor and that irony and kind of makes the the narrator be more self-aware and yeah and and you know again instructing him on the importance of laughing at oneself right the narrator tries to dish it back and interrupt one (laughs) there as well yeah but I mean, there's something at moments natural about their conversation. And then at other moments, there's something I think like clearly artificial, right? Like there's there there are there are moments when it's, you know, when the conversation it's like it's it's not reality, right? I think that if you like go into this book and you're like, this is about two real people in some real room together having a real conversation in real time then you're just like what people don't talk like this right like you have to embrace the fact that it's it's kind of a dream space you know it's you know the palace where it's set in the middle of the desert is it's kind of a nowhere right it's kind of like just this liminal in between space between life and death between the past and the present etc right my question for you about that is this idea of realism, I mean, versus creating this sort of dreamscape for the book, because I feel like We the Animals, to me, it read, it reads very realist, in, in my opinion. Um, and this is a quite, you know, different book, even though there's kind of tonal similarities, and they're in conversation with each other, I would say. But in terms of making the palace a setting for this book, like what work do you think that is doing for it? Yeah, I mean, I think that We the Animals, it's like one one step away from realist right like it's a or a half step right like a, a lot of people read it as just straight up realism I'm like you know I, I never f- felt that way I I felt that it was just like you know it was like making myth out of out of family and childhood right like it's like you know like there's just there's a lot of the mundane aspects of, of life that are <laughs> completely extracted from that book but yeah but yeah but basically very close to realism. And this is a much bigger step um, away from realism. I think one thing that happened was I get sent a lot of books to read and blurb and and like, you know, a lot of them are, are fantastic, but I, I started to feel, and I teach creative writing, you know, and I just, I, I just started to feel myself like a little bit like exhausted by the demands of realism, you know, like it, it felt, I don't know. I'm 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 always excited when I come across a kind of wild text that's just like, what is happening here? <laughs> like, what are the laws of of this book? Like, I you know they, they seem to be constantly shifting, and yet I still want to read. And I wanted to write a book like that where where you didn't quite feel like you had purchase on exactly what its relationship to realism is, right? Where there's just this muddying that's happening constantly and so 
that was my that was my intention. Reminds me a lot. So one of my favorite books of the year as well, another FSG title is Biography of X by Catherine Lacey. Um, mm -hmm. Have you read that one? I haven't read it yet. I have it. I bought it, especially because I was like shocked at how similar when I read the description. I don't I don't know the text, but I because I, I haven't read it yet. But when I read the description, I was like shocked. I was like, what is happening? This sounds very similar to what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it's quite similar. It's also quite different. Um, I love them both, but it's for that reason that you said. It feels almost like this like battleground for yourself of like kind of all of these different kind of forces at play in the novelist's mind kind of coming out in this weird form. And that's why I think I love fiction so much is because I love when a novelist takes on the capaciousness of the form and really tries to like kind of bend things in certain ways. And I mean, this book I think is a lot dealing with balancing the personal and collective histories in the form of narrative. And how can you do that in a way that like, make sense for a reader, but also might be something completely different in your mind and mine and how much like a reader might bring to the story. I'm tying this in part to how this book deals with one queerness and two um, Puerto Rican history. And so myself, my dad, he's Puerto Rican and my mom is white. So my dad, he has never been to Puerto Rico. He grew up in Boston. I don't have a lot of family on his side. And so a lot of what I know about Puerto Rico is just from what he's told me for the most part. And like growing up, that was all I really knew. And so when I was reading about Puerto Rican history in this book, it was just really fascinating to me to kind of see how you're grappling with that on the page. And so it's a very broad, I don't know, imposition of my own history here, but I just wanted to ask you how you think about that as related to the ideas of queerness and history in this book. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think that, that you and I and the narrator of this book as well, there's a lot of overlap in, in that. In, in, in what you've described, you know, the kind of family dynamics that you've described. I think that the narrator is one of the things that attracts and attaches him to Juan and, and Juan to, to narrator, right? They meet in the mental hospital with, when the narrator is like 18 and and then they don't see each other for 10 years and then they're, they're back together when this book is opening. Um, but one of the initial things that attracted them is, you know, is, is like, this sense of tribalism, right? It has to do with queerness and it has to do with Puerto Ricanness as well. Um, and, and you know, there's something fascinating there because the, the narrator, he feels, you know, he doesn't speak Spanish. He feels there's something that's kind of, you know, missing there, right? And there's, there's something that, there's a real longing to know and to connect and, the way that the book gets into it is through is through this thing called Puerto Rican syndrome, which a friend of mine had recommended this this book called Puerto Rican Syndrome to me by uh, this Argentine writer who wrote this who's who's a Lacanian analyst who and she she wrote about this this crazy thing that existed in the DSM called Puerto Rican syndrome, like it actually was a diagnosis in the DSM. And so then I started doing research and I tried to find the original article that likes kind of the spark that prompted you know, what, what came to be known as Puerto Rican syndrome. And I, you know, I, I took excerpts from that article and put them in the text. But yeah, I think that the narrator is looking to Juan for some kind of satisfaction, which I think, I think is, is an impulse that we all have, right? To be like, what is, like, it's, you know, it's like, it seems like, like identity seems massively important, right? To, to everyone. But what happens when you're, when you're like, coming at it and and Juan is dislocated right like he he left Puerto Rico as a young boy and he has some kind of strange nostalgic relationship to his own Puerto Rican dance, even though he's you know like island born and speaks Spanish and you know and it's like the like what happens over time right as you move further and further out and this is this book is a lot about the periphery and like you know, like writing from the periphery and wondering if there really is a center, right? Like about qu with queerness, with about all different kinds of identity. It's a lot about the use of peripheral vision. And, and that's something that in the final version, it's, it's not in the galley, but in the final version of the book at the end, Juan talks about peripheral vision and, and, and the past being right there in the periphery at all times, right? That like, if you try to look, it, it stays on the periphery, right? Like when you turn your head, you're, there's always something there in the peripheral. Yeah, that, that's a fascinating idea to me, especially when trying to capture that in fiction. I mean, a, a lot of this book is thinking about 
the story of Jan Gay. I feel like we, we have to talk about that because it's, <laughs> it's a huge part of this uh, book. Yeah. And focusing on her story and I guess through piecing all of these things together, like how did you think about her inclusion here? Jan Gay, yeah. I, I think that I didn't want to write historical fiction, but when I researched the story of this sex variant study, which is central to the text, I discovered Jan Gay. Um, and it's this has a lot to do, uh, I got a lot of this from um, this book by Jennifer Terry and another book by a guy called Henry Minton. Um, and they both kind of touch on the origins of the sex variant study and they talk about Jan Gay. And so then I just was like, who is Jan Gay? Like, let me, let me find her. Cause she's not in the text at all. And she's fascinating. She was like a nudist. She was a big lesbian activist. The whole study was her idea. She was so disappointed with the final result. She was really kind of crushed by it. She wrote an angry letter, you know, about the committee of doctors that ended up taking over the study, right? How much they had like used their own moral judgments and, and failed science, really. Like she wanted this to be a scientific endeavor. She's also, she also wanted it. She also believed, she was an activist, right? She believed that if these stories got out there in an unbiased way, they would sway public opinion about homosexuality. She was not born Jan Gay. She changed her name to Jan Gay, which, you know, with, along with her partner at the time, they both changed their names to, to, to the last name of Gay, right? Which is just like really bold, <laughs> but also hidden, right? Like, you know, it, it, it at the time, it was it was much more known code among queers than it was commonly used. Like gay, what it didn't mean gay in the mainstream culture as much as it did among gay people themselves. So she made films about nudity. Um, some of there's a couple film stills in there from from her film on nudity. Yeah. She, she was just fascinating, and I really wanted to write about her. Like, I could never write historical fiction. Like, I just, <laughs> there's something about historical fiction where everybody's always writing about the present anyway when they do it, right? <laughs> and so I just thought, well, you might, I might as well just have it be very much um, a story that's unfolding in the present, right? That, that Juan is to telling to the narrator um, about Jen and her life and, and make it a movie and re again, really emphasize what is artificial and what is factual or archival or textual, right? So there's a there's a letter from Jan Gay, right? A, that's a poem that she wrote, like the actual photocopied page of that from the archive appears in the text, right? There's there's an image of the actual Jan Gay in the text. Tons of illustrations from Xenia, her her partner, sent tons of children's books with illustrations. The narrative of their lives is completely made up and it's very clear that it's made up right that it's that's it's an imagining an imagining right like it's it's an, an, a character telling a movie plot that he's made up about jan's life yeah. even like how you know jan her life relates to wands and like raising him as a young child and all of that like i think it's, it's, and it's interesting how you kind of intersperse like those those images, I mean, this book, just like how it reads, I mean, it's a lot of, you know, kind of vignettes, maybe that's not the right word, different like, kind of short sections, and then interspersed with these kind of different photos or what have you. In terms of like narrative and how it reads, how did you think about like the right place to put those, if that mm -hmm. makes sense? I mean, I think with the blackout poems, I made a lot of those blackout poems, um, like more than are in the book. And I tried to find the ones and the moments where I thought some resonance between what was happening in the narrative and what's happening in the kind of erasure poem, right? So there's like one about this longshoreman who's like, you know, hustling and having sex with guys for money. And, and you know, the final line is like, I was 20, I was alive, I, I was wise to a lot then. It's what comes right after a moment when the narrator is talking about being 20 or, or 18 or, you know, and like being so uncomfortable in his body and like wanting knowledge and wanting to know more and you know and and so they kind of juxtapose each other really nicely i think uh, the same with the images i tried to find moments where the text is they're directly referencing the images right so you know there's this guy dickinson who's a famous gynecologist who was really important in the sex variant study and there are a couple images from him in there and and it's in moments when it's talking about 
about him. Um, and yeah, but also I, I also wanted them sometimes to just interrupt. Like I wanted them sometimes to feel like, what is this? What am I looking at and why am I looking at it right now? And how does it relate? Like I, I did want to kind of pop the reader out a little bit um, because I think that one of the things that happens when you're like looking at archival stuff is it's just, a, it's like a lot of ephemeral stuff that you're just like, how do I connect this, right? How do I, like there's this object or image or text and then there's this and like what, like there's, I don't know what the narrative is that connects these two things, um, but yet here they are side by side. And so I wanted the reader to have that to have that experience. It's so successful in that front because I get nervous when I see like, I don't know, maybe like in postmodern fiction when something like this kind of gets included, like it, it makes sense. So, <laughs> and so I wanted to commend you for it. Like it's really interesting how you kind of piece all that together. And it just seems really difficult to do in terms of narrative. I guess my next question for you is about editing and revision and how you knew that this project was finished or do you feel like it's still kind of evolving in your head the final version is you know there's there's some differences between the galley version um and one of the major differences that post face um that that you that you referenced at the beginning a sort of post face which is again an homage to a sort of preface by tony cade bambera to, to her book gorilla my love that now comes after the end notes the, the blinkered endnotes because because like the end notes are also from the perspective of the narrator just as the post face is right like it it's again it's like it's 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 you know it's a bit of a puzzle and it's a bit of you know there's a lot of ambiguity about like is this the author right now or is this still the narrator right like you're <laughs> like you're just like who's who is this like and I wanted to have that ambiguity in there and so but I think that by putting the, the post face after the end notes, it makes you re I realize that the end notes are, are also part of the text, um, that they're also part of the fictional text. And so that's a switch. And there's like a little bit of language that was added around that. But yeah, no, I mean, could I keep, could I have kept editing it? Yeah, probably forever. I mean, thankfully I have a really, really brilliant editor, Jenna Johnson, who she, edited We the Animals and she's, you know, we've been working together for 12, 15, I don't know how many years, so many years. And so she was like insistent that it was done. And like, I, I want, I tried to pull the book, <laughs> like, right, like, like at the last moment, like after the last moment, I was just like, no. And she was just like, trust me, you know, and I kind of had to. and. Uh, I'm really glad I did. I'm really glad I did because I don't know. I don't love having a book in the world. I, I, I do enjoy editing. I don't really enjoy writing that much. I love editing. I love tinkering. I love getting the sentences just exactly how I want them. I love thinking about the arrangement of the images in the text. I love, you know, like I, I like to make, I like to make stuff. Um, but yeah, it can, it can be hard to kind of let it go because what's on the other side is, I mean, it's fun talking to you right now, but that's also, you know, something that is not as easy for me. I think it's really indicative in just how the book, I don't know, is as an object and, and how you, I see like how much structurally you're playing around in this book is really cool. And I mean, I think that's it's something that I love as a reader um, to see authors that really, you know, kind of bend and play with that. And I'm glad that Jenna pushed the book out into the world. I think it's so good. So um, it's always interesting to hear. I mean, yeah. One of the things that we really wrestled with was, was how the images would appear. So like, I, I really wanted, at first I wanted color and that was like way too expensive. And then what I really wanted was sepia. And cause I, I really thought it was important to have a kind of nostalgic tinge to it all. Cause it's, the book is about nostalgia as well. And, you know, Juan says in the book, you know, he, he's, he's quoting William Maxwell, um, but he talks about nostalgia being, you know, a trap, right? That like, you can get stuck back there, right? In, in, in this like half imagined past, right? That's not really the past. It's, it's, it's your dream of the past. And that, you know, the, and the trick is not to get trapped back there. But there's also something so alluring about dreaming up 
past, right? Like, like you know, again, allowing with your imagine with your imagination, and like you know, and and so anyway, I wanted I wanted the, the images to have this kind of patina or to have this kind of sepia quality, um, and that was also too expensive. <laughs> and so what we ended up doing. We have to send you a final book, but what we ended up doing is uh, printing the whole book in brown. So the text itself is brown as well. Um, and all the images are kind of brown scale rather than gray scale. And I think it works really well. I think it kind of looks like it's vanishing. I really wanted this book to be a, a beautiful object. Like, I, the, the, the final book is so much prettier than the galley, um, but I really wanted it to... Yeah, I wanted to emphasize um, the kind of the yeah that the, the books are objects, right? That, that we do kind of engage with them, especially like in such a digital age. It just seemed important to me that like, well, what can fiction do, right? Like, that to slow us down. I'm excited to see the final copy because I I will say this is one of the most like nicely constructed galleys I've ever felt. And there's something, so being a nerd for a second about reading, like when you're reading it, you feel this kind of slipperiness on your yeah. left hand. And it always like kind of reminds you that it's like a book in some weird way. I don't know. But then it also gives like a reflection on the front. I, I'm just glad to hear that you also love books as like final objects, because I think this one is, is gorgeous, even in galleys. Some more questions for you on on this book. One being something you mentioned earlier about how you love, you know, editing and being in that process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're here uh, I asked you to come on the podcast. I guess my question is like about doing press for your book and talking about it as the author when the book is, you know, so intentionally playing with these questions. Like, is it annoying to have to talk about the book um, in a certain respect? Or is it like, do you like it? Like, I guess, what's your relation to like speaking about the book yourself? That's such a great question. I think that in an ideal world, yeah, like the book could just end on its own and 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 just go out there and do its thing but it would save me like the the anxiety that I feel around you know talking about it and I don't know reducing it or sim or oversimplifying it or you know it's like I tried to make something that's really engaging and also really puzzling you know <laughs> and I don't want to demystify too much right because I think it should it might kind of ruin something. On the other hand, like, it's delightful that people, that you, like, all you want when you work on something for so long is for people to think about it deeply. And so, like, to hear your smart questions and, you know, like, it's, it's, it's just so lovely to meet somebody who's read what you wrote and given it a lot of thought. And so... I get a lot from doing this, you know, like I, it, I, I receive quite a lot um, just from the kind of questions that are posed to me. If I could just have the questions and not have to answer them, that would be, <laughs> that would be perfect. Like, just give me your questions and be like, yes, yes, that's a great question. That's a great question. That would be, that would be heaven, but it's not, it's not how it works. I think some people are, are better suited to it than I am. For me, it's, it's really difficult, I think, to have a book out in the world um, and to like, I don't know, the, the public facing part of being an author is strange. And I put on a good face and then I like shake in my hotel bed, you know, for like three hours. I'm just like, what did I say? What did I say? What did I say? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it must be nerve wracking. I mean, I'm not a writer, but, you know, being on the other side, trying to do this podcast, I try to make it a point that like, you know, being part of the press run for an author's book, I try to make it as like, I don't know, chill as possible yeah. <laughs> and just fun and like a companion piece to the work, not, you know, anything too yeah. kind of too deep or like a answer to the to the fiction or something, you know, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I mean, you're, yeah, you're, you're great. You're, you're great at this. Um... Um, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Just, I always end every interview with, you know, an open-ended book recommendation question, anything you like, all-time favorites, or recent books that you read and you're looking forward to, kind of anything you want to talk about in terms of other books. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think that, I guess I'd start with this book called My Body is Paper, which is by Gil Quadros, who was a writer who died, you know, he, he had AIDS and he died at the age of 34. And um, he wrote one book that came out just before he died um, called City of God, which is 
one of my favorite books of all time. And it's it's like a bit of a cult classic. And I just, I really, it's like half fiction, half poetry, half, and I just love it. I think, you know, there's just something so lyrical and beautiful and I don't know. It's just, it's great. I highly recommend it if you haven't read it. And now, you know, 30 years later, some, a colleague of mine at UCLA, Rafael Perez Torres, and a bunch of other people like Terry Wolverton, who was involved in the original, and she was like taught a writing class he was at. Anyway, these people have come together and they're bringing out his unpublished writing. And I wrote a foreword for it. So it's very much at the front of my mind. I, I just wrote a foreword for it um, recently. So that will come out probably next year. And I'm, yeah, I'm super excited about it. I just read a book called The Love of Singular Men. It's by this Brazilian writer, again, who, who died young. I know, there's <laughs> a theme here that's emerging, which I did not intend. But um, he, it's it's just really, it's like nothing I've read before. And it's really inventive and it, like incredibly inventive, like brilliant. I highly, highly recommend that that as well. Yeah, those are the books that are surfacing at this moment. Thank you for sharing those because your work engages with a lot of like, it's just exactly what I look for in fiction. So I'm always curious to see like, what, what are you reading and what's informing the way that you write? So I, I need to read Puig because I keep, for some reason, I keep seeing his name mentioned lately. Like it's just sticking out to me and I've never read him before. So I am oh, making yeah. it an effort to do that um, soon. So I think he has a book with McNally editions. It's something about Rita Hayworth. I forget the yeah. title of it. Is that, have you read that Betrayed, one? Betrayed by Rita Hayworth. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's fantastic. I would I would recommend starting with, with Kiss of the Spider-Woman just because if you've just read Blackouts, you know, like it, you'll be like, oh, wow. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, but Betrayed by Rita Hayworth is, is fantastic as well. He's, he was a genius. He was a, he was a bona fide genius. <laughs> Yeah. I'm excited to read them. And just thank you so much for coming on today, Justin. This has been such a pleasure. Um, admittedly, I was very nervous about it. Uh, <laughs> and I wanted to like, it reads really easily, but there's so much like going yeah. on and so much to grapple with that I was like, how am I going to, you know, get to the meat of what's going on here? Because I have so many like, I don't know, different thoughts that I keep saying. Such a joy meeting you and congratulations on everything. It's an exciting morning. And thank you for taking time to chat with me for an hour in the midst of like your celebrations. It means the world. So thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for doing this. I'm really, really happy that we spoke. <laughs>